This video goes with section 41 of Hansen and Quinn's Greek, an intensive course, and it covers conditional sentences. Hansen and Quinn introduces this on pages 93 to 98 of the textbook, and it goes back over it in the appendix on pages 747 to 751. Conditional sentences are if-then sentences. An example in English is, if this happens, that happens. The idea is that whenever the condition in the if clause occurs, the action in the that clause occurs. But we can change it up. If this happens, that will happens, happen is a little different, and it supposes a possible action in the if clause, and it makes a pretty definite claim about what will happen when the if clause comes true. That difference in meaning took a change in tense in English from that happens to that will happen in the then clause. Conditional sentences are even one of the places where English still uses the subjunctive mood. If this were happening, that would be happening. The if clause in this instance has the English subjunctive and the assumption behind the sentence is that the action in the if clause isn't happening, but the stuff in the then clause would be if the stuff in the if clause were happening. Greek also uses different moods and tenses to give different implications to the conditions in if clauses coming true or not. So let me give you a little bit of jargon before I show you how Greek does conditionals. The if clause is called the protasis. In the English, the protases up here are if this happens, if this happens, and if this were happening. The then clause jargon is apodosis. So in our English examples up here, the apodoses are that happens, that will happen, and that would be happening. You can even see from the Greek that you already know the before in the pra of the word protasis, and that help me, helps me remember the jargon sometimes. So, so, in Greek, to know how to translate a conditional sentence, you need to check four things. Whether the if is a or aeon, what the tense and mood of the protasis verb is, what the tense and mood of the apodosis verb is, and whether or not there's an on in the apodosis. Check all four things and identify the Greek conditional sentence pattern and then translate. So let's go on and learn those patterns, which each have a protasis and an apodosis. We're going to learn six basic patterns of conditionals. There are a few more which are pretty rare to see, so we won't bother with them. And the ones you are going to learn can be mixed and matched a bit, but we'll deal with that when we see them in examples in real sentences. So, our first pattern is future more vivid. The if is aeon, and in the protasis it takes the subjunctive. And that subjunctive can be present or aorist, and the difference is about aspect. In the Apodosis, it will have the future indicative. The default translation for the future more vivid is if she verbs, she will verb. If the condition in the protasis happens, in other words, the action in the apodosis will pretty certainly happen. Our next pattern is future less vivid, and we're going to end up calling this the should would conditional for reasons that you'll see. It gives a less sure prediction about the future if the condition comes true. We get A plus the optative in the protasis, and again that optative can be present or aorist, and the optative, present or aorist, in the apodosis plus on. So A plus the optative and the optative plus on is future less vivid, and the default translation is if she should verb, she would verb. The on is just a marker for the conditional type, so you won't translate it separately from the rest of the sentence, but it tells you which way to translate it. Our next pattern is present general, and that tells you what always happens if the if clause is true. In this we get a protasis with aeon plus the subjunctive and an apodosis with the present indicative. 
The default translation is, if she verbs, she verbs. Now we'll do the past general. And that tells you what always happened when the if clause was true. It doesn't necessarily give you a hint or know whether it was true, but it's sure about what happened every time the if clause was true. The pattern is a plus the optative, could be present or aorist, and then the apodosis has the imperfect indicative. You translate if she verbed, she verbed. Now we have two more. The first is the present contrafactual, or easier to say, contrary to fact. The assumption here is that the if clause is not true, it's not a fact, but the writer really wants to tell you what would be happening if it were. This pattern is a plus the imperfect indicative and the imperfect indicative plus on. And the translation default is if she were verbing, she would be verbing. Of course, it means if she were verbing, but she's not, she would be verbing, but she isn't. Now let's go on to one last one, the past contrafactual or past contrary to fact. With this one, something wasn't true in the past, but we need to talk about what would have happened if it had been. So this one, the pattern is a plus the aorist indicative in the protasis and the aorist indicative plus on in the apodosis. The default translation is if she had verbed, she would have verbed. In other words, if she had verbed, but she didn't, this would have happened, but it didn't. The negative for the assertion part, the apodosis, is ooh. And for the unreal, the supposition, the if clause, the negative is may. So let's look at some Greek. Aeon angelon pemse ten machen paususen. Here's the if clause, and here's the then clause. So we can see our protasis and our apodosis. Now let's look at the four things you need to check. The if is aeon. The verb of the protasis is subjunctive. And the apodosis verb is future indicative. And there's no on. So this pattern we can see is future more vivid. And the default translation is, if she verbs, she will verb. So our sentence is, if she sends a messenger, they will stop the battle. You can put clauses in the other order without any change to what the sentence really means, just as you can in English. We could translate this, they will stop the battle if she sends a messenger, and the implication is the same. But, of course, you need to see more. So, here we have a angelon pempsai ten machen pausayen on. Here we have the protasis and the apodosis. And now we're going to check which kind of if. It's an a. What verb in the protasis? It's optative. What verb in the apodosis? It's also optative, and this time we do have an on. So that pattern, a plus the optative, and the optative plus on, is future less vivid. And the default translation is, if she should verb, she would verb. So we can now translate the sentence, if she should send a messenger, they would stop the battle. I'll show you this one backwards, too, and you can see that it still does the same thing. It's still following the same pattern, and you can tell how to translate it according to the rules that you're going to learn with these patterns. Okay, how about this one? Eon angelon pemse ten machen pausen. You can see your two clauses. Which if... This time it's aeon in the protasis. It's got a subjunctive in the protasis, and it's got the present indicative in the apodosis with no on. And so our pattern is present general. The default translation is if she verbs, she verbs. 
And so the sentence is, if she sends a messenger, they stop the battle. The implication is, anytime she does, they do stop the battle. We don't know if she is or not, if she's sending a messenger or not, but we know this is what happens if she does. Let's continue. A angelon pemsai ten machen epawan. So, here we have our two clauses. Our if is a. Our verb of the protasis is pemsai, so that's optative. Our verb of the apotasis is epawan, which is an imperfect indicative, and we don't have an on. So our pattern is past general, which is if she verbed, she verbed. And so we translate this time, if she sent a messenger, they stopped the battle. We don't know if she did or not, but we know for sure that if she did, they definitely stopped the battle. All right, now, how about a angelon epempen ten machen epawan on? We see our clauses and we check that if. It's an A. Then our first verb, the verb of the protasis, is epempen, so that's imperfect indicative. The verb of the apotasis is also imperfect indicative, epawan, and we do have an on, so we've got present contrafactual. If she were verbing, she would be verbing. And so our translation is, if she were sending a messenger, they would be stopping the battle. But we know she's not, and so they aren't. But the way that we translate the sentence to indicate all those things is, if she were sending a messenger, she would be stopping the battle. And that's a beautiful present contrary to fact. One more. A angelon epemsen ten machen epasan an. So, we see our two clauses. We check our if, and this time it's a. We have epemsen, which is an aorist indicative. And then in the apotesis, we have epasan, which is also aorist indicative. And we do have an on. And that makes it past contrary to fact. If she had verbed, she would have verbed. And so we get, for this sentence, if she had sent a messenger, they would have stopped the battle. But we know that what that sentence means is she didn't, so they didn't. But the translation is, if she had sent a messenger, they would have stopped the battle. So learn these six patterns, and you'll be prepared to meet most any condition. Practice them in the drills and try translating the sentences.